Trigger warning. This podcast contains descriptions of various abusive situations. Listener discretion is advised. They believe that if you don't do what they say, if you don't believe and view the world in the same ruins as they do, then you're going to go to hell when you die. Right. That's the bottom line. <laughs> yeah. That's what keeps people there is because they're afraid of going to hell. You are listening to the Preacher Boys Podcast, a podcast shedding light on decades of mental, physical, and sexual abuse within the independent fundamental Baptist movement. The testimonies shared on this podcast are told from the personal experience and perspective of the survivors. Not all legal outcomes are known or final. Any suspect is presumed innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. To find more information about the Preacher Boys podcast and upcoming documentary, visit PreacherBoysDoc.com or connect on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at PreacherBoysDoc. Now, here is your host, Eric Skwarzynski. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Preacher Boys podcast. I'm so excited to welcome Zach Phelps Roper onto the show today. Uh, Zach, obviously, um, you know, I, I mentioned in the intro beforehand, you know, people are probably fairly familiar with Westboro Church at large, but it's it's pretty rare to get to hear from someone who is a former member. Um, but I, I just want to know, um, I was rewatching Louis Thoreau's documentary, and one thing that just comes to mind right away is like, these are actual people. Like, this is a family. These are, you know, people with real life experiences. You know, uh, they they go and hang out. They have, you know, family activities. Like, there's a there's a humanity there uh, underneath the the signs and the the pickets and all of that kind of stuff that we see on the front page of newspapers. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about your earliest memories, kind of growing up in the in the Westboro Baptist Church, and uh, you know, good and bad? Like, what what do you remember early early on? If I remember correctly, Westboro started their picketing right about the time that I was born, about okay. just about thirty years ago, in okay. nineteen ninety. Um, I would say um, I always felt kind of different from people outside of the church. I didn't always jive with like classmates and mm. people didn't really um, like their parents didn't want them to get to know me too well. Right. Um, as far as like uh, the church itself, I have many good childhood memories. Um, it wasn't all bad, so to speak. There are some rough parts though to my past. Uh, um, the people at Westboro um, can be very cold hearted at times. They can be very, you know, authoritative parents. Um, you know, corporal punishment was something that I was um, definitely exposed to. Mm. But um, the pickets and stuff, um, yeah, from the time I was able to hold a picket sign, I was holding one. Right. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I was pretty much indoctrinated and, you know, brought up in the church from the very beginning of the picket. So it was really all I knew. I mean, early on when you, when you first were going to these pickets, like, what did you think of it? Like, did, did it make sense to you while you were doing it? Was it something where you were just kind of along for the ride for, for some of that stuff? It was probably along for the ride until I was about 13. And I okay. think that's when I was baptized. And right. that's when I started to, I guess, really feel like I needed to be, a member of the church rather than just, you know, one of the children who were brought mm. up there. The church is very unique in that it's kind of a church and a denomination to itself. Like it's not a part of a Southern Baptist convention. It's not even really um, an offshoot of anything. Uh, do, do you kind of know the history? Like, like when Fred, when Fred started the church, you know, do was, did he have influences? Did he have people that he at one time, you know, felt really connected to, or that he drew a lot of inspiration from in those early days? Good question. Sadly, <laughs> I only know so much about the earliest days of the church because it was about three or four decades before right. I was born. Um, I know that my grandfather basically became the head of the Westboro Baptist Church about a year or two after it was, you know, the building was built and, you know, parishioners started to come. From what I understand, um, it became very tight knit and even kind of. Um, <laughs> He was considered a radical even for, you know, before he started doing the pickets. If you don't want plain, clear, bold, Anglo-Saxon Bible words, Bible sentiments, and Bible doctrines on your peanut show, why did you call me an old-time Bible preacher? 
I'm not a politician, a social worker, a psychologist. I'm a Bible preacher with a commission from God that runs like this. Son of man, cause Jerusalem, that is America, to know her abominations. Ezekiel 16.2. Fags are America's abominations. How in God's name can I cause America to know her abominations? If you let fags control the lexicon and muzzle me. Like a lot of families that were started to go there initially, I heard left and um, it became even more exclusive to his family and um, a few, just a few other families who had been there for quite, you know, from the beginning, like uh, Bill and Mary Hockenberger. Um, they were the, uh, or they are the, the matriarch and patriarch of the Hockenberger family. They were there from with my grandfather from the beginning. What what percentage would you say was family versus not? Because it's it's, I mean, you can kind of justify in your mind and say, okay, maybe there's one family that just chose to do this, and and they're kind of these outliers. But what's shocking to me is when you see visitors or when you see people who are, you know, like I mentioned uh, Lauren's book before we start recording, like her dad going and joining the church, you know, that's hard for me to reconcile and, and grasp. But what, what percentage of that was outsiders versus family? I would say uh, <laughs> the, the lines get blurred with every passing year because uh, there used to be other, you know, at least three or four different families, I guess there was the Phelps and the Hockenbargers and of course, Steve Drain's family. Yeah. But because of the, uh, <laughs> the smallness of the church, um, I would say at least 80% of the parishioners there are related to me by blood or marriage. Um, they, they intermarry. Um, mm. Like uh, Lauren Drain could have married one of my cousins who was, a, you know, with the last name Phelps, right? Um, mm. But yeah, most of them are related to me. So you guys went to public school. That's pretty shocking in and of itself. You you didn't have that, uh, what I think people would expect to be like a sheltered, homeschooled kind of environment. Uh, what was the reasoning for sending you to a public school? Um, and uh, what was public school life like when you're going home every night back to Westboro? Uh, the reason why Westboro sends their kids to school is because they do believe that we should have an education. We sh I was expected to go to college hmm. and, um, you know, get a degree and things like that. But my mother puts it this way. Um, we are like walking picket signs. And so that basically is a, is a preaching opportunity when we're in school, I guess. And, you know, sometimes we, I would talk about my, you know, my former faith and uh, beliefs in uh, say speech class, for instance, or when, you know, when it would come up in the natural, you know, course of classwork. Um, the other question you're asking, what was school life like? Um, There, there were times when I was uh, picked on or bullied, mostly when I was younger, um, but uh, I did well in school. I almost, I got straight A's for most of my education from middle school to the end of my uh, degree at Washburn University, which is uh, for nursing school. Okay. It's a bachelor's degree. So gotcha. yeah, I would say I did well. <laughs> gotcha. I tried hard. Mm -hmm. Right. So there wasn't a lot of resistance in the, in that movement to keep you in a, in like a ministry mindset. They wanted people to be doctors, lawyers. They they wanted to push you to be the best you could be essentially. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Say um, so. uh, when you, when you see clips, obviously when you're looking at a documentary, when you're looking at something, they pull, most of the stuff is pulling into the anti LGBT stuff, the, the more radical statements. Um, would you say that was the majority of the teaching or would you say that the, the theology was a lot more nuanced than maybe like documentaries would show, or do you feel like it was pretty straightforward? Like, Hey, we're, it, it was kind of focused about us being a light and a, a picket, uh, a walking picket sign in the community. There was a lot more to their faith than just the website, you know, God hates It's, it's far more. Um, it goes much deeper than just their, um, you know, hatred which i do feel like i was taught to hate members of the lgbt community oh. i certainly didn't have much respect for them until i left seven years ago um but basically the the bottom line of west pro's theolo theology is that you have to obey the commandments of god you have to read the bible and you know you have to live according to 
what the Bible says you ought to live your life, or at least according to Westbrook's perspective. Um, Because there are different kind, there are different Christians, right? And they have their own unique beliefs. And um, they believe that if you don't do what they say, if you don't believe and view the world in the same lens as they do, then you're going to go to hell when you die. That's the bottom line. (laughs) Yeah, That's what keeps people there is because they're afraid of going to hell and um, they want to, you know, be devout, faithful members of Christ and go to heaven when they die. Yeah. So did hell terrify you as a kid or did you feel like a a sense of security? Like, Oh, I'm part of the church. So I'm not, I'm not as concerned about it for me personally. Uh, I know other people are going to be going, but you know, I feel pretty secure that I'm part of this church, you know, hell did terrify the fuck out of me. (laughs) (laughs) And, um, I, uh, that took me a few years to shake off. Um, when I started to question the authority of the Westboro Baptist church or of the Bible for that matter, that, you know, so that was something very real and it did terrify me. It would keep me up at night. I would, Mm. you know, have nightmares and, you know, just, it was just, uh, it was horrible. It was a horrible feeling. And um, that's what kept me there for most of the time I was there aside from my love for my family and not wanting to part ways with them. Yeah, that's an interesting dynamic in and of itself. Like there were, there's been many family members that have left now. I mean, there's, um, you know, Megan's left, you know, uh, Libby, like there's, there's a good list of people um, that have left. Did, a lot of those left before you did. Um, how, how did that work in the family? Was it something where they were not spoken of afterwards? Is it something where they were spoken ill of after? Um, what was kind of the emotional reaction to seeing, you know, the people you, you guys had spent every day with all of a sudden being gone and like cut off from the, from the church. You can bet your butt they were demonized. You can, yeah. I'm sure that they would have said, <laughs> it's funny because um, one of my friends who is in contact with members of Westboro has spoken to some of my, um, some of my family and they all call me troublemaker, <laughs> <laughs> call me a troublemaker and that I was dramatic and other, whatever it is that they <laughs> said, but <laughs> But um, yeah, when someone leaves, they are considered a non-believer, a heretic, a fool, and unworthy of unconditional the unconditional love of their parents. Right. And so, what does? Well, I'll tell you what my dad does. He um, he will remove photographs of people who have mm. been kicked out or who left of their own free will. He removes their photographs from the photo albums, or you know, and from the pictures on the wall. So it's like out of sight, out of mind. They completely forget about that person. And it's just like a forgotten, it's like a long, it's like a forgotten memory. They're just a memory. What about for you as a, as a kid? I mean, obviously you're, you're being indoctrinated. Was it the same thing for you or was it something where it's like, this doesn't make sense. Like, why can't I see, you know, this person that I used to see or did you have that same mentality, you know, out of sight, out of mind? I had the same mentality. That's what I was taught to believe. And honestly, I didn't want to go to hell. So I didn't want to go against the church. This is something that, again, is hard to wrap your mind around is when you're in a a situation where you're being heavily indoctrinated, like people who are in much less controlling environments struggle to make a change, like changing your faith at all, or it is a big decision. And most people don't, they go their entire life sticking with whatever they were taught as a kid and they stay in it because there's the, all the fears associated with, with changing, um, for you being, being so heavily indoctrinated, you know, being in an environment that is so overreaching and controlling, like, how did you even start getting to the point where you felt like, you could even ask yourself internally, like, what do I believe? Is this right? You know, is this, is the church, do, do they have the authority that they, they claim they have? Like, how do you even start that dialogue when you're in an environment like Westboro? I can tell you, I basically almost left the church permanently about three or four times before my final departure. Really? And yeah, like I had packed all my bags and was ready to go, or I actually had moved somewhere. And within a few hours, maybe a few days, I would be terrified of the thought of going to hell and Mm. asked to to return. When I felt like I was being unfairly treated by my parents, that was probably the the biggest issue I guess I had. I felt like, like the first time I wanted to leave Westboro, I wanted to become a doctor. Mm. My parents said, no, you're not going to do that. And when I asked them why, they said it's not up for discussion and i felt like you know 
we were taught that being a member of the church, you had an equal say in the church's operations, right? But there's a double standard because if you are an older person, you have the right to tell someone younger than you to shut the hell up and drop the discussion if they ask questions or if they want to talk about something. Hmm. So I didn't feel like an equal member. I didn't feel like my parents were being kind to me by telling me that I couldn't try to pursue a doctorate degree or a doctoral degree, um, medical degree. Sorry. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, other times I was just, I don't know. The last time that I left, I felt like my parents weren't taking my lower back pain and shoulder pain seriously. Mm. I had developed an injury in my first day working as a nurse in a hospital mm. due to poor body mechanics. And uh, my preceptor wasn't using like the proper equipment or whatever, you know, to lift a patient, you know, properly. Mm. So like I was in all this physical pain and I was trying to figure out how to fix these problems you know, scientifically looking at, you know, medical articles and things like that. Cause I was afraid that something bad was going to happen yeah. if I didn't try to do something about it. My dad told me that I wasn't praying enough mm. and, um, he got upset when I reported my workman's compensation injury, you know, my first day working as a nurse, he was upset about that. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah, I felt like, uh, I felt like they didn't take my pain seriously. And the night that I left, I was asking my dad if he would take me to the emergency room. And he told me to shut up and go back to bed. Wow. And I just felt like he wasn't, he didn't take me seriously. And I asked him, did you think, I, do you think I'm just making this up or that I'm exaggerating? He said, yeah. Hmm. I'm just like, why are they? I tried to be a very hardworking member of the church, tried to do whatever they put in front of me to do. Right. And I tried to take on additional responsibilities of the church, which were not really necessary because of my devotion to my family and to the church. And so my dad jumping all over me because I didn't want to, I wanted to take some time off from the remodeling that they do on church projects, you know, because they have big families, they need bigger houses. Right. He got upset because I said I didn't feel up to doing the work because I was hurting. And this is some, this was my norm, right? I was yeah. a very self-sacrificing person who put other people before me. And the moment I said, you know, I need to take some time for myself to try to heal. They got upset. Hmm. So right. w yeah. you had mentioned that sometimes people could be very cold in the church. Would you say that was the majority of the emotion or, or I guess you could say lack of emotion, or do you feel like it was very on a switch? Like it would be very overtly loving to very cold and harsh. It can go back and forth pretty quick. Right. Right. Um, mm -hmm. on, on that note, I'm just I'm kind of curious. So uh, one, uh, there's a lot of things about Westboro that just, you know, I, I come from a very conservative religious background, not anywhere near the same, the same level or, or category. And there's few places that I think you could say are the same, the same level or category. Um, but there's many things about Westboro that are, are very unique for a very conservative kind of Christian denomination and uh, whether that's the use of profanity, they, they're they very comfortable using um, language that a lot of conservative uh, Christians don't use. Um, but I'm also, mm -hmm. I'm also fascinated too, that women tend to be very uh, have like strong leaders in the church as well. Um, at least from looking on the outside, some of the most outspoken members are females that they make it onto news broadcasts. They're at the pickets. And uh, usually women are put in the background in a lot of conservative Christian churches. Um, how, how were women, I know how you were treated, you know, as a child growing up in the, in the movement, how were women treated overall? W was there that same animosity toward females in the church as well? Or was it pretty even ground there? It's a very good question. Westboro believes that women are the quote weaker vessel mm -hmm. and that they are more apt to, um, you know, responding to situations emotionally rather than, you know, logically or wisely. Um, there are verses in the Bible where they, they quote to say that um, women are not supposed to be preachers in the pulpit, like during the church services. Right. But at the same time though, they also believe that um, there are 
that it's okay for women to like publicly talk about their beliefs. You know, right. they right. call them um, the prophet Isaiah in the Bible apparently was married to a woman who was called a prophetess. Hmm. And so my mother said that it, there was no, um, there's no problem with say her on the picket line talking about her faith and her beliefs. Right. There's nothing wrong with that. But when they're in the church services with their butts in the pews, they have to cover their head with a scarf or some kind of covering, which is what is you know prescribed in the Bible. And, um, you know, they're not allowed to talk. They're not allowed to lead sermons. Another aspect, though, is that women are supposed to be in subjection to their husbands. So if there was a conflict between a woman and, a, and her husband, the woman is supposed to shut up and listen to the man. And right. sometimes that did happen. Although I will say this, um, I do believe that my father dearly loves my mother. And he did, I think, set a pretty good example for me to how to treat women and especially respecting my mother. Mm. So interesting. Yeah, it's it's interesting. And that's that's what's fascinating about, like I said, like Louis' documentary. Um, you know, it, it's so fascinating seeing the dynamics that are so completely normal um or or so genuinely, you know, kind. And there's those moments of, 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 you know, I guess I could say like po positive family interactions, but they're sprinkled in with this, you know, the vitriol and the, the things that people tend to associate. And so I just mm -hmm. can't imagine the, you've already alluded to it with like, you know, talking about like, you're terrified of hell, you're frustrated with family, you want to go back because you're scared of hell, you feel like this, this missing of the family. And um, it's just, it, it's a, it's like a blender to emotions and to like reason because it's, it's such a, it's such a strange environment. Um, so, so it seems like the first few times that you left were purely just frustration, like just built up kind of like probably like most young adults is like, I just need to get out of here and live my own life. But when did it become something where you started questioning like the actual ideology? Because being frustrated about an environment's one thing, but to to question like core belief systems is a totally different journey. What what kind of kicked that off? As I kind of mentioned before, um, I was afraid of hell and a lot of um, my biblical beliefs that I was brought up to have. Um, those took a few years to unravel, right? Um, as I would put it, uh, if Westboro's belief system was like a suit of armor, which does not allow any kind of um, room for questioning or, you know, difference of opinion, then, you know, if that faith is absolutely true and you can't question it, then all you really have to do is find one thing about the way they believe or see the world that is not true. And then you can start to destroy that armor piece by piece. Right. And that's kind of what happened. I discovered when I left Westboro that I started to have peace in my life. It started to get a little bit easier, I guess. Right. And, um, you know, cause I didn't have my parents, you know, what's the, what's the word, um, you know, trying to control me and yeah. chew me out. And I don't know. I, I felt like I was starting to gain peace. And I also started to make a lot of friends through social media, mostly on mm. Facebook people were reaching out to me from across the country and across the world, even LGBT, LGBT people. And um, they also helped me to question my faith. And I started to see, you know, that there was room for growth. Yeah. And so, yeah. When you, when you left, did you connect also with like family members who had pre previously left or did that take some time before you felt comfortable kind of rebuilding those relationships? I actually reached out to former members of the church before I left about two weeks really? before I left. Yeah. The shit yeah. was starting to hit the fan as they say. How so? <laughs> and, uh, well, kind of with my parents, like I said, my dad didn't believe that I was truly suffering as much physical pain as I was having. Mm. And my mom was, you know, <laughs> uh, she was, I, I don't know. There's something about Westboro. They, they don't like it for people to stand out, right? Like you need to conform to, you know, and look like you are a humble, you know, ashamed person who wants to serve God. Right. And, um, so, yeah. So like if, if you do something out of the norm or whatever, or if you seem to attract attention to yourself, just, and that's what a lot of people confuse mental illness with. They, they think people are just trying to get attention for attention's right. sake. Right. 
And um, so that's not all, that's not really the case all the time. People get you know become suicidal. They become distressed and frustrated, and they need to be able to talk to people. And um, so I'll just use this example. My mom was upset about the way that I was bending down to like load dishes into a dishwasher because I was having lower back pain. I was using proper body mechanics as opposed to like arching my back, which puts you in more pain or, you know, more danger of getting hurt. Right. And she said, you're posturing, stop doing that. Mm. And it's like the stupidest shit to get angry about is what yeah. I, is, that, that's what I mean. Yeah. Right. See, that, that's what I mean. You, you, they don't want you to stand out. They want you to just kind of go about your business and be a little robot or a little bit, you know, a bee that just, does what you know what i mean do you uh, b before we get into like reaching out to the family members because this is this raises another thing that's come up in my mind quite a bit too sure. do you feel like everyone in the leadership position so like even like the basically anyone who is an adult parent uh like pastoral leadership like you know fred you know all all these different people do you feel they truly believed what they were teaching or do you think there were some of them who they like the control that the teaching gave them because uh, I could see some, especially when you look back at a founder, like, you know, or, or not founder, but early leader, like Fred Phelps, you have to question, did he just appreciate the fact that he had this very committed family base underneath him that would do what he said? Um, or did he truly, did, do you feel like they truly do believe that theology and that fuels all of these actions underneath it? Most of them probably do. I hmm. mean, I was also a committed member who, yeah. believed everything that I was told by my parents without yeah. question. Um, and, uh, but, but you're right. It's possible that some of them might be kind of power hungry too. A lot yeah. of people accuse Steve drain of being like that. In fact, most of the people I talk to dislike him the most. Right. Right. And um, I don't know. I, I don't know the hearts of men, but I do know some people, like you said, you know, some people are about power and yeah. aggression and about control. Did people in the church ever pick up on that with Steve? Did they ever say like, oh, is he really serious about this? Or is he just, is it just something for him to do? Like, or was it mainly outsiders that had that concern? Mostly outsiders. I've never heard any, I never heard any of these opinions until after I left Westboro. Right, right. I respected the man. Sure. I respected his family. So, yeah. So, so getting ready the, the two weeks before then, wh who was the first person you reached out to and kind of what was that, what was that conversation? Was it just, was it you just kind of testing the water to see if it would be okay to leave? Was it just seeing how they had experienced things after they'd left? Like, what was the conversation there? Well, I was telling them that I was having problems with my parents and I didn't know exactly what to do. Mm. Um, of course they, they saw the, um, the pot boiling over before I did long before I did. And they said, you know, you're probably not going to last there another week or two. And they were mm. right. Um, but, uh, yeah. Um, it was one of my cousins, um, that I grew up with one of my best friends that I reached out to and I tried to tell them what was going on. And of course they wanted to make sure that if I left Westboro, that it was because of, the, of a theog theological, you know, difference of beliefs as opposed to just being frustrated with my parents. They asked me that question straight up. Yeah. And I told them that, yeah, I, I don't like the idea of the, you know, the God that they're teaching me about, you know, like I, I thought that the, I believed in this, in their God. And I believed that he was becoming a sadistic bully because he was punishing me for trying to, you know, serve the church. Mm -hmm. I just felt like it was, yeah, you're right. Actually, I was pissed off. <laughs> there was a difference of belief starting there because I felt like it wasn't being treated fairly, not just by the members, but by God himself. Did you communicate straight through those two weeks? Were you just messaging back and forth with them and like just asking different opinions? Or was that kind of that conversation? And then you tried to just hold out two more weeks and see if you could see if you could keep making it. I was reaching out to them almost daily. I actually went and saw them in person at their, uh, oh, wow. their residence shortly thereafter um i was able to sneak away you know go do something for you know talk to them for a couple hours and i was yeah they're um they're all the, the the cousins that i reached out to also put me in touch with another one of our former members of westboro and i went to live at their house when i left okay so they were helping me kind of fix things right 
Um, so what was the period? I mean, I, I have to assume it's still a journey of trying to figure out, you know, how to process everything. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's not an easy thing to just snap into like, okay, that happened now moving on. Um, what was the hardest part of that initial journey out? Was there, was there a pretty strong longing after leaving to, to go back at, at any point? Did you feel like, all of the same fears about, you know, oh, am I making a huge mistake? Did I just leave the church? You know, like big C, like I, I left my chance here. Um, or, or like what was kind of the big pain points when leaving initially? The greatest struggle that I've ever had in life was with my own self-esteem. And mm-hmm. I think that when my parents were willing to cut me off and have nothing to do with me for a difference of opinion or belief, um, i I felt like I was trash. I felt like I was unworthy of being loved or of experiencing compassion or empathy from others. That was partly partly why I was attracted to go to the outside world because I felt like people that I was meeting through work, for instance, were being kinder and more empathetic, more understanding of my situation than they were. Mm -hmm. Not every person at Westboro is, was as hard as my parents. You know, there are some people there that I genuinely think, they don't deserve. <laughs> they don't deserve all the kind of people. I'm just messing with you. No, <laughs> those kind. Of, if those people that I, you know, that I was, you know, the closest to want to stay there. That's 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 their right or whatever. But as you start making friendships, and you mentioned even people, I have to imagine. I mean, it's a jarring situation to all of a sudden be making friends with people who are part of a community that you were literally like picketing. Um, did you did you struggle with guilt? Um, did you, did you have a, did you start feeling like, man, I, I spent so many years, um, in this environment, you know, even though knowing deep down, like it's not your fault, you're, you're born into this, you're raised in this, but did you feel like a, a sense of guilt or like a responsibility to like make amends or, or what was kind of the process? Cause I, I can't imagine like sitting across from someone and feeling like, and just a few years ago, this conversation wouldn't have happened. I did feel at first very ashamed of my actions at Westboro, but others did tell me, you know, my new friends that I met after leaving Westboro, that it wasn't my fault. Like you said, that I was born into it. That This was not something I chose for myself. This is what I was, this was the hand that I was dealt. Um, but yeah, for a long time, I did feel like that I needed to contribute to humanity to try to make up for the pain that I've caused and um, and that's kind of what's led me since then. I wish to be a servant of humanity. And um, I've learned a lot about how to do that through um, the teachings of such uh, people as Jesus, of course, but also like the Buddha and Socrates and Lao Tzu, Confucius and other what they call masters or self-masters. Um, I actually wrote a book on some of their teachings and things mm. um, that I share with people. It's, uh, it's been quite a journey. Right. Um, what's your goal? I mean, I know obviously like the relationships with the church are, are pretty cut off at least on their end. Um, do you make an effort to try to reach out? Um, is it something where, um, you know, you've got any hope to try to, to get anyone else and any, you said it's their right to attend. Um, but do you ever try to reach out and persuade or convince anybody there to like, you know, double think about what they're, what they're doing or, or to potentially leave the church. I used to do that a lot more often when I first left because I didn't want to lose them. But since then I've kind of tried to just accept the situation for what it is. Um, certainly people who have left Westboro, you know, have committed to going on the outside world. I have showed my unconditional love for them yeah. and tried to give them the support they need to make it out here. Right. Right. Um, uh, so just for looking at the church, I want to get into a couple, um, a couple questions that some of my, some of my uh, community on Facebook had asked, but um, I, I wanted to ask, so Fred Phelps uh, passed away just a few years ago. And um, what do you think the future of Westboro is like from the outside looking in and just kind of tying in your last experiences there? Do you think it's, it has a long, uh, like a lot of legs underneath it. Do you think it's, it's going to kind of lose direction now that he's, he's gone? Like, what do you think over the next few years you're going to, we're going to see happen with Westboro Baptist church? Sure. So even, even before my grandfather passed away in March of 2014, just a month after I left Westboro, they had, um, they had elected, um, 
a unanimous decision, eight of the oldest men in the church to be the board of elders or the yeah. pastors, yeah. bishops, whatever you want to call them. And um, since leaving, since I left Westboro, you know, there have been new members that have come and, you know, another family that joined in the jocks. And um, I know that every, about once every year, a young person will leave Westboro because that's been the pattern. And that was kind of the pattern before I left too. Usually yeah. about one person would leave. So um, I do think that they're probably going to be around for probably a few more decades, at least, unless something dramatic happens. What I can tell you is this though. Um, I do have evidence that they are arranging marriages, which was not something that they did when I was there, hmm. or at least not that I was aware of anyways. I know that um, one of Steve Drain's daughters was proposed to by one of my cousins named Stephen. And when, and when Taylor went to talk to her dad about, you know, getting married to him, uh, Steve put his foot down and said, you're not going to marry one of those, not going to marry one of those Hockenbargers. And mm. she ended up marrying my cousin, Jacob Phelps, Jacob M. Phelps. So mm. that's a little bit concerning. Usually yeah. they allow people who want to get married to marry. And I don't know if that's a controlling aspect of Steve or what, but uh, there have been four marriages since I left, which is pretty unusual. Right. Well, it's a Thank pretty you. small pool of people. So mm -hmm. Um, are, are there people uh, just, yeah, I'm, I'm curious too on this. Are there, I know there's people that consume the content online and you know, that's something that Westboro prides itself on is that they've got a, a large online reach. Um, people consume the the podcasts or the streams and things like that. Um, is there, were there a lot of supporters across the U S who just didn't live in that area who endorsed what Westboro did, or was it more people the people who listened were mainly listening to either mock or to just to see what was being said. By far, most people are not going to join Westboro right. because they're just so they're just so radical and they just, it doesn't look like the love of Christ on the outside of it. You don't feel that kind of love. And some, some people who did join Westboro ended up leaving because they didn't, they weren't feeling the love. Right. Right. <laughs> they right. They were promised. Right. No. So, um, yeah, I can't yeah. imagine the retention is great with new members. I mean, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's uh, pretty unique. No. Um, yeah, so I have a couple of questions. So I, I have a, I have a private Facebook group and I, I just mentioned I had someone coming on and, and asked if people had questions. Obviously, people had a lot of questions. Um, so I just want to run through a couple of them. Sure. Um, a couple of them I had already asked. So like, what made you want to leave? Um, which we kind of went through. Um, what was the what was the most difficult thing uh, from your upbringing to reconcile like with reality? So maybe like what was one of the last things that you were holding onto really tight where like that worldview took you the longest to say like, okay, I'm letting go of that. Like that was something that I was taught and it stuck with me through and through a lot of stuff. Yeah. The most, um, the worst, the hardest thing for me to, to deal with was the prospect of going to hell when I died. Mm -hmm. And also that the, that the Bible was in fact the infallible word of God and was therefore prophetic. So like, um, you know, prophecies of revel of the revelation, the mm -hmm. book of revelation were, um, were somewhat scary or frightening. Right. And, um, I don't know, man, I just, <sighs> I started to realize that just because I believed in something or, you know, thought that it was going to be true, it was not necessarily true. Right. It's, um, it's important to be discerning and to question uh, authority of any kind, really. Um, and so that's kind of where I stopped trying to, you know, trust in the authority of someone else and instead just trying to lean on my own understanding a little bit here and try to make, you know, try to see if, um, you know, um, I mean, there are people who read, you know, Jack and the Beanstalk, but most people don't believe that it's true just because it's written down on paper. Hmm. And that's something I, I learned to reconcile, you know, um, don't trust anything is truth without proof. If right. you can't to me, and I'm not trying to bash anyone who does believe in heaven and hell, but the question I asked was, how do I know that these places, that these literal places exist? 
unless you're dead, right? Because you have to be dead to see either of them. And I decided that there was no satisfactory answer to that question. Therefore, there was no reason for me to fear or to look forward to either of those. And that's kind of the litmus test. If there's evidence, you know, strong evidence or, you know, something, some reason to believe in something other than just blind faith, then okay, I'll right. support something, right? But, you know, to each their own. At right. least I'm not afraid of hell anymore. Right. It doesn't terrify me or keep me up at night. Yeah. It, so you mentioned Bible. Someone asked if they, uh, did they read the Bible? And they said, I'm kidding, but at the same time, not. I think they're asking, you know, obviously there were verses that were quoted and, and you know, statements that were heard in the preaching, but just personally, you know, did you guys spend a lot of time personally, like reading the Bible, like studying the Bible, or was it more, you had your kind of pocket verses to engage in debate or discussion? Um, like what was kind of the balance there? It was a bit of both. We definitely did reading on our own time. And of course, during church services, Right. but you know, there were certain things, certain questions that people would always ask or certain comments that they would make, you know, disparaging or, you know, con- what's the word? Uh, mocking comments kind yeah. of. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, um, I over time became something of a robot, just kind of mechanically responding to people's questions with the same the same answer every time. Right. It was quite comical. Yeah. <laughs> right. Did, did you guys listen? This is just from me, but did you, did you guys listen to any preachers outside of the Westboro? Were there anybody else that you, you guys admired or that you thought of as being, you know, on the right path? Yeah. Um, my grandfather, you know, we, um, in order to try to understand some of the more difficult, you know, more recondite, more difficult, passages of the Bible, which were hard to make sense of, we would look at expositors. And the chief one that we always looked at was a guy named John Gill, who lived hundreds of years ago, but was apparently deeply enthralled by the Bible and was able to make, um, you know, deep connections between various scriptures. He's right. incredibly fascinating to listen to. He'll pull up something that I would, you know, you know, he'll, he'll pull. Yeah. Just the most, um, the most distinct, disparate um, verses together hmm. to form ideas and positions. So it was very interesting to, li- to listen to. Right. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, so uh, let's see here. Uh, one of them was, uh, is there anything you miss from your time there? I know we covered that a little bit. Do, do you, I know you said you've kind of learned to accept it, but is it still, do you still have periods where it's like very difficult to, you know, deal with the fact that like, you know, separated from family? Do you miss, do you even miss, um, I, I know for me, even like sometimes I miss some of the traditions or like, you know, services or conferences and things like that. Is there anything that you, you tend to find yourself going like drifting off and missing? I miss spending time with my family. I miss playing video games with my younger brothers. We call them the four little boys. Mm. <laughs> my mom had 11 kids. <laughs> so yeah, there was a lot of, um, there's a lot of stuff I miss about my family there. Um, but at the same time, I also acknowledge that, you know, it's important not just to look on, you know, the past, not just as, you know, with nostalgia, but with all, but with also a sense of realism. Cause I know that if I was at Westboro, my parents would be teaching me the same. They would be talking to me the same way they were when I left. Wow. They're right. still, their hearts are still closed to right. people on the outside. And so um, I don't want to be harangued or, <laughs> you, no. you know what I mean? I don't want to be bothered by people that aren't going to treat me with respect right. as a human being, you know, oh. with some sense of open-mindedness. Okay. We don't have to be perfect to be members of Westboro and you don't have to be perfect to be a member of the human race either. So someone asked about um, the protests at funerals uh, specifically, and they just said they wanted to know how did they convince people in the church to participate in activities like that? Uh, how was it presented? How was it spoken about? And uh, what was kind of the, the way that people were persuaded to think it would be okay to do so? Well, first off, uh, <laughs> if it comes from one of the elders or from, a, or if it had come from my grandfather, most of them would have probably eaten it up with that question. Hmm. But to be more specific though, the reason why they would use to picket soldiers funerals or like the victims of HIV or AIDS, 
um, was because they, 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 they cite a chapter in the book of Luke, I think chapter 17, where it talks about Jesus telling a parable or something. He talks about a guy, a rich man who lived really well. And then he had, and then there was this poor beggar outside. Um, the beggar's name, I think was, if I remember correctly, was Lazarus or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And, um, well, yeah, you probably know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so he, they said th- that, um, the, the people in hell would want us to warn the living lest they should also enter hell. You know, like um, the dead soldier's parents, his siblings, his friends, you know, these people, the, the dead soldier is in hell and there's no hope for him. But if you go out and warn the living, then maybe they might repent and be saved by God or, you know, yada, yada, yada. Right. <laughs> and did they, that's one thing that, that popped up a lot in the, uh, in the documentary with, uh, with Louis and even with, um, I think Vice had done another one I had, I'd watched. And when asked about it, um, it would be it would be questions about you know are you trying to convert people do you think if you're presenting the message this way people may not you know uh may not want anything to do with the gospel and things like that and they would say well our goal is not conversion like surely would say you know you know we're not here to we're here to tell them the truth we're here to tell them you know what you know god's judgments on them uh, did you feel like there was actually legitimate like desire to convert people or to actually try to save people? Or was it something where it was like, that was just how they explained what they were doing. I think some members of Westboro probably would take pleasure in the fact that some of the people they were preaching to were going to burn in hell and I guess receive their just, uh, you know, comeuppance. But when I was at Westboro, I felt like I had won the lottery, so to speak, and that I was in a position to, you know, perhaps be able to go to heaven. You know, I had all these people who I believe were, you know, good for my soul, good for my, my well being. And, um, when I looked at people on the outside, I, I didn't look at them with derision or judgment. Um, you know, I didn't hate them. I think I pitied them actually. I think, and the reason I think this is the case is I, I read an article <laughs> where I had spoken to a reporter Um, before I left Westboro when I was still there. And I was saying that, you know, most of these people across the street that are kind of, you know, kind of protesting us, these people are going to go to hell. And I said, that sucks. That sucks. Cause I didn't want them to go to hell. I wanted people, I wanted people to repent yeah, and, you know, join our fold and, you know, serve God and be happy. Right. Um, Right. Um, I just have two more questions here. Uh, I'll pick through. Um, and the last one's really in, uh, in touch with what the show is about. But uh, right before this, it says Westboro has a practice of suing individuals and communities, um, like people who speak out against the church. Um, I don't know that that's the case. Um, what did they? I know that they often were sued or that they often had people come after them and they were very gifted lawyers. So they, they knew how to, <laughs> they knew how to work around this stuff. Um, but Westboro did, I know Westboro did sue um, in one instance because they ended up going to the Supreme Court um, over this. They've actually went twice, right? To the Supreme Court? I'm trying to remember. Well, I think they're, um, well, to answer the first question, um, my mother often said that if, if we sued every person that did something bad to us on the picket line or, you know, battered us or threw stuff at us, we would never be out of the courtroom. Right. We wouldn't have time for pickets. So that's what they would probably say is that they, they don't normally sue people. Um, okay. With your um, regard, with regards to Westboro going to the Supreme court, um, I know that I only, I think that only happened once, but that wasn't because Westboro was suing someone. Yeah, they were sued. They were getting by, sued. Yeah. by Albert Snyder, the father of, um, of, de- of a dead soldier named Matthew Snyder. Um, right. I was actually at, his, at the funeral of that picture, mm. by the way. Right. I discovered in hindsight. <laughs> yeah, someone mentioned that. I was like, I don't think that they ever sued. I know they were often, I know that they often got into people legally threatening them, but I didn't think it was the other way around. Um, the, the last question here, and this is a fairly sensitive question, but it's, it's one I cover on my show pretty often. Um, a lot of times within... Uh, you know, cultish groups or, or denominations that are very, um, that are along these lines, uh, molestation and sexual abuse is pretty commonplace. Um, is that something that happened at Westboro? Is that something that 
you know, was commonplace? Was it something that happened that you're aware of, or was it something that to your knowledge, there was never anything like that? So two thoughts come to mind. The first thought is, is that I don't believe that they engage in things like incest or, and they certainly don't take a, um, (laughs) they just, they certainly don't look at rape as being acceptable because that's also something I think that they say is, you know, against the law of God and just plain evil or plain unkind to people, mm-hmm. not something that they would believe in. You know, these, these are moral, morality, truth, you know, law and order, justice. These are the kind of values that Westboro espouses. Right. Um, so they definitely wouldn't be on. No, there's that baseline morality there yeah. when it comes to that stuff. Okay. Mm-hmm. I, I've, I, I figured not. I figured that would have been something to be covered at some point, but um, they had asked. I, I was I was interested to know your answer, but um, yeah. yeah, no, I, I mean, I I really appreciate. I've been following you now for a couple of weeks, and we've we've connected, and and um, it's just interesting. Like even reading some of your posts, and like you know, because you had posted about like missing, you know missing the folks at Westboro. And I was like, for me, I think that's, I think that's so important when we have these conversations with people and even thinking about people who are still currently there. Um, I think it's easy. And and I say this as someone who I plenty of times have gotten upset about, you know, something that Westboro said and, and um, you know, or something that, you know, some other denomination or person has said, but you also have to remember too, there's a lot of factors at play. You know, there's a lot of, um, not at all apologizing for the rhetoric whatsoever. Um, but you know, there's a, I, I have to imagine that there's a lot of people. Um, there's a lot of Zach's in places like this. There's a lot of people who are sitting there going like, I don't, I want to leave, or I don't want to be a part of this, but I don't have an option. I was raised in this. This is all I know. And I, I just want to say, thank you. I, I know it's, I know that healing is not a overnight thing. I know that you're still, like I said, you're still working through figuring out your own worldview and and trying to just be a good person. Um, and it, it can't be easy to just walk down this path, talk about all of these memories. And so I just want to say thank you for for taking time to do it and for for having this conversation because that it's really important, really helpful. And uh, it takes a lot of strength to do that. So thank you. Thank you for listening to the Preacher Boys podcast. If you appreciated the content on the show, please leave a review on iTunes. And don't forget to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at Preacher Boys Doc. Additional information can always be found on PreacherBoysDoc.com.